I'm delighted to be welcoming you to the sixth Tanner Lecture on Ethics, Citizenship, and Public Responsibility. I'm Grant Reher, Director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute here at the Maxwell School. Campbell is the principal organizer for the Tanner Lecture Series for the school. And we're excited and honored to welcome back to Syracuse Colin O'Mara, the President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation and a graduate of Maxwell's MPA program. He's the definition of the local kid who made good and a model for young people who want to make a difference right out of the gate in their careers. My colleague David Van Slyke will have more to say about Colin in a moment, but before he does that, I want to tell you a little bit about the series itself and about its sponsor, Dr. Lynn Tanner. Uh, Lynn is a Maxwell PhD and CEO and chairman of Tech Canada, an enterprise which generates ideas and social capital among top executives. Lynn's life and career has been concerned with the joining of theory and practice, posing challenges to commonly held distinctions between the public and private sectors and generating value for the firm and for the broader community. The Tanner Lectures at the Maxwell School ask some big questions about our mutual obligations and responsibilities as citizens, such as those that we're considering today concerning the environment. Lynn has been keen to explore these questions and to try to answer them through the notion of what he calls generative activity, activities that create, produce, and most importantly, enrich our private and public lives and reflect the choices that we make. And we're grateful to Lynn Tanner and Margaret Graw for their vision and for their generosity, and also for coming back to be with us for all of the lectures so far. So Lynn and Margaret, thank you very much. I also want to thank Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman and the Campbell Institute for their hard work in putting together this event, and Maxwell School Dean Jim Steinberg for his instrumental advice and help. I have an added pleasure this evening, which is to introduce my colleague and the recently named Lewis A. Bantle Chair in Business and Government Policy, David Van Slyke. David will introduce Colin and manage our conversation this evening. David's been on the faculty since 2004. His research focuses on public and nonprofit management, government contracting, public-private partnerships, strategic management, and policy implementation. He's introducing Colin tonight because, among other reasons, he taught him when he was here, and he has been a mentor to him since. And I think that speaks to what we do best here at Maxwell, helping to educate, inform, and hopefully inspire America's leaders. Now, we'll make sure to have some time at the end for a Q&A session with all of you. And when we get to that point, um, if you'd like to ask a question, I would like to ask you to do two things. Uh, first, uh, please be relatively brief to give others a chance to participate. And second, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you so that all of us can hear you and so that your question can be part of the video archive. And I guess the third thing is give the microphone back to the person <laughs> after you're done making your brief question or comment. While I'm asking you to do these things, there's a, one last thing I want to ask you to do, and that is to please turn off the sound alerts on your smart devices and other phones and things that make those kinds of noises. Final thing is at the conclusion of the program, we will all go upstairs uh, to the commons room where we will have a reception where we can continue this conversation. But David, turn it over to you. Thank you. I am delighted to welcome today Colin O'Mara. Uh, Colin's graduate of the 2006 MPA class here at Maxwell and in an impressive class that was, I think one of the most impressive. And I'm hoping for all of you in the 2015 class, you're you're here and observing Colin and some other grads like uh, Andy Maxwell up there. And uh, for many of you, what you may not know is you've heard that Colin is the CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. But Colin has been a policy and political junkie since he was three. That may be an exaggeration. I don't think it was quite that late. And uh, Colin almost instinctively, you know, in addition to being well-rounded and being the captain of the baseball team over at West Genesee, seemed to have this 
innate ability to think about politics, but not just in a political orientation, but also in a policy orientation. Not just in a policy orientation, but in a management and implementation orientation. Not just in a management and implementation orientation, but thinking about it as an organizational orientation. And so I think Grant is being gratuitous and, and giving me more credit than I deserve when he says I taught Colin. It may be more appropriate to say that Colin taught a number of us. I had Colin in a graduate class in public organizations and management in the fall 2005. And I distinctly remember Colin coming to me on several things. How to better design an assignment. How to never again offer a midterm examination. <laughs> how to facilitate a case study on performance measurement using an approach that at the time I thought was absolutely genius and it has stuck in my mind forever. Let me just give you 30 second insight into that. The topic was performance measurement. What gets measured gets done. Colin and a team came in and they, had, they split the class into two groups. They gave each part of the class a big ream of Xerox paper. With one set of assignments to one group, they said, make airplanes that fly, that fly across the room. To the next group, they said, make as many airplanes as you can. And so at the end of this three-minute case study facilitated exercise, one group had 10 airplanes. The other group had 100, 100 that looked like pieces of paper that you were throwing into a garbage can. The other group had 10 that actually flew across the room. It was insightful, and I think even at that point, I had said I had made some comments in class about Syracuse's performance system, and I was quite critical of it in terms of a lack of leadership uh, to really create credible commitments. And Colin came up to me at the end of class, and he said, I kind of designed that system but I was 12 at the time. So I appreciate your you know, insight into credible commitments. And so we've had this kind of rich and wonderful uh, relationship now over the last 10 or more years. And I've been able to see Colin move from being a clean strategist for the city of San Jose to becoming one of the youngest appointed state officials in the nation when he took over as Secretary of the Environment for the state of Delaware for a brand new mayor who had a very different, a brand new governor who had a very different set of expectations about qualifications, credibility, age, and a lot of the things we think of as conventional norms about preparedness. And he basically handed over the keys to the shop and said to Colin, I want you to go out and I want you to do something. And one of the things that's impressed me about Colin and why I'm so happy he's here to speak in the Tanner series is because many of his attributes and his commitments are very much like those of Lynn Tanner. A, create, a commitment to public service, a commitment to the creation of value, a commitment to public service and creation of value that isn't simply within government alone, but thinks about public service across the three sectors, government and business and industry and civil society. And in doing so, I think that takes away the stigma associated with working across the sectors, working with people with very different political philosophies, ideological orientations, preferences and motivations for change. And for Colin, change isn't just for change's sake. And value creation for him is focused. It is oriented toward a set of goals. And he is really moving forward in a very deliberate and intentional way to make as much of a difference in public service, wherever that happens to take him. And I think in many ways that's consistent with Lynn Tanner and the work that he's done to date and the work that he continues to do. So I cannot tell you how happy I am that you've all come out because I assure you that you will be delighted to hear from Colin and the conversation that we're about to have. Colin, thanks very much for being here. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you all for coming out and braving this frigid uh, temperature and like, unbelievable snowfall that we're seeing. Um, we were getting a little nervous, and un unfortunately, um, tomorrow morning I have to speak to a, the Garden Clubs of America, so we couldn't push it back a day. 
Um, I love being in this room. Um, my, my two years, my year here, sorry, it just seemed like two years. My, uh, my calendar year here um, was an absolutely incredible experience. And, and I think that one of the beautiful things about Maxwell um, is this blend of really first rate social science and, and an interdisciplinary study with the application. And so today, I'm going to challenge us to think about a series of environmental challenges um, kind of through this lens of very applied um, policy making and hopefully draw some conclusions at the end for how we address these unbelievable challenges that our generation is going to face in the, in the years ahead. Before I begin, I, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Tanner and, and his wife Margaret um, for the incredibly generous gift that they've given to the university. I had a chance to see the Bill Bradley lecture a few years ago online um, on campaign finance and kind of the need to reform institutions. Um, and it was a fantastic speech. So if folks have a chance to look at some of the previous speakers that are much more interesting than me, um, please, please do that. But again, just Dr. Tanner's vision for doing that, I greatly appreciate. Um, it's always good to be with, with Professor Van Slyke, who mentioned he, is, he has been an incredible mentor to me. But also, Mitch Lewis is here, who was a, on the faculty of Maxwell at the time, but was actually my first Democratic political boss in, in Delaware um, after I had worked for a Republican congressman. Um, Mitch and I worked together on his race for mayor. And although the, the race was unsuccessful, the ideas that he put forward um, were incredibly important. And a lot of the things I'll talk about today around decision making with data and things like that um, were ideas that he was pioneering at the time. Um, my first actual government boss on the Democratic side here as well is Ann Rooney, who actually designed and was the, the brainchild behind a lot of the Seriostat work um, that really put the city on good footing at the early part of the, early part of the last decade when the city was in some rough shape, and Ann's done an incredible job as one of the top leaders in the county in the time since then. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank my, my father and my sister who are here, um, who braved their way from Camillus to, uh, to, to come for the, uh, the speech today. So it is absolutely wonderful. And also, I said a great chance to meet your dean here, who is wonderful. And Dean Steinberg, thank you very much for hosting me as well. Um, I want to talk today about the, the challenges of the environmental space and how citizenship and ethics really are absolutely essential to dealing with them. The, the thought that I will kind of come back to a couple times, you know, you've often heard the adage that if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody hear it? My question is, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to see it, does anybody care? We're coming up on a time right now where the conservation ethic in this country is possibly at its lowest point ever. ever. Of course, we have folks that live outdoors that are, you know, that are going out hiking, fishing, kayaking, biking, whatever, every weekend, but that percentage is becoming smaller and smaller. You know, there's folks that some folks like to consider kind of lumber sexual, if you will, the guys that have those like flannel shirts with the mutton chops. There's a couple of you guys here today. I'm assuming you're from ESF. Um, <laughs> but that percentage of the total population is becoming worrisome in many ways. And the reason that it's becoming worrisome is that we have a generation right now of kids. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter, daughter Riley, that's actually in Camillus right now, probably playing outside still. But the average kid right now, from the age of five to about 12, is spending about 50 hours a week in front of some kind of screen. 50 hours a week. And that's outside of the 30 to 35 hours a week that they're in school. And so for, thir for 50 hours a week, I mean, that's more than kind of the labor full-time full -time job. So if you add that to the 30, 30 to 36 hours of school, and then you say the kid's sleeping for eight to 10 hours a day, there isn't a whole lot of hours left to do anything. Now, you compare that and contrast that to when you know, we were growing up and even our parents' generations were growing up. Um, I'm still putting myself in the we student category. I think that's becoming more tenuous every day. Um, when you think about the change that we've seen, you know, and a lot of it actually occurred in the late 70s and early 80s. In the late 70s, early 80s, you had things like Atari and you know, games like Oh, I, I don't know. You had all kinds of games like Millipede and all these kind of you know, Pong type games. And then in the, in, the, in the 80s, you had things like Nintendo and you know, Duck Hunt was all of a sudden a video game, not something you did on the weekend. Um, you had games like Super Mario and Zelda. And then all of a sudden you had Sony, right? It came up with like, I don't know, all kinds of, all kinds of craziness. And then all of a sudden the internet revolution comes. And so you know, AOL and you know, Netscape and all those things you haven't heard of if you're born after 1985 or 1995, I mean. But the, the, the challenging thing was all of a sudden there were all these things that you could do inside that were safe. You know, television was already there, but you had all these other activities. And there were more and more things pulling you inside at a time when more and more parents were concerned about whether or not their kids would be safe if they played outside. You know, stranger danger, the 24-hour news cycle, all of a sudden, every time a child was abducted anywhere in the country, it was wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So folks assumed it was a lot worse and a lot less safe than it actually was. So put all that together. Now flash forward 25 years. Those kids are having kids. And so if those kids didn't have those outdoor experiences, there is really no way that they can pass that experience on to the next generation. And so if the parent was playing Nintendo all the time and he's got every single sword or belt or whatever from Zelda, and all of a sudden he's trying to talk to his kid about going out fly fishing, he probably doesn't know how to actually cast. He probably doesn't know how to go out hiking. He probably doesn't have, have those kind of experiences. And so what happens is you move from a sustainability and conservation ethic that is ingrained in the personal experience to one that's merely academic. 
Now, some of this will sound familiar. There's a guy named Richard Liu who wrote a, child, wrote, wrote a book called Last Child in the Wood, Woods a few years ago, talking about this concept of nature deficit disorder. And what's scary about this, this, this kind of phenomenon is you're seeing kids playing more and more time indoors and less time playing outdoors. You see a series of societal impacts that come from it. And folks often focus on things like childhood obesity or the focus on juvenile diabetes or a lack of critical thinking ability because all of a sudden you're not doing leadership things with your, with your fellow, you know, your neighbors on the block. You know, you're playing video games maybe with a headset on. Um, but you're not actually interacting with people in any kind of meaningful way. There's also uh, attention deficit orders that all of a sudden come up when not having kind of sustained outdoor activities. Um, and then there's obviously some general happiness issues because it's not nearly as satisfying a life to have a series of online kind of virtual credentials and trophies as it is actually having you know, friends and rich relationships. So you put all that together in a policy context and it gets pretty scary because you have kids that don't actually have a, a human connection, a, a visceral kind of heart feeling connection to conservation issues. Now at the same time, those very same kids in school are being told things like they should recycle, right? They should turn off the lights when they go outside. They should you know, take the chance to you know, understand the metamorphosis of a butterfly. But it's not actually connected to them themselves getting outside. Now think about those same kids. You know, these are the kids of the kids, for those of you keeping score at home. Think about those same kids as they're growing their, kind of their, their, their government, their, their, kind of their civic responsibilities, their, their citizen chops, if you will. When you look at conservation issues right now, they're scoring among the lowest in terms of ranking of any time in, in many, many decades. Now, they score very well, even climate, right? Climate will score over like 50 to 65 percent um, citizens wanting action. But if you ask them where it ranks in the list of categories, it falls somewhere around you know, 16 to 18, depending on the survey, depending on how things are put together, you know, behind you know, the economy and healthcare and immigration and, and other issues. And so my, my thesis for today um, is really that you cannot have an engaged citizenry unless we do a better job making sure that citizenship includes some form of environmental ethic. And that the, the shortcomings that come from not having that be part of the ethic is exactly the lack of bipartisan support you see for a lot of action right now. All of a sudden, the science is not enough. Right? We're living in an era where the science is overwhelming on many of these issues, clean water, clean air, climate issues, species issues. The science is absolutely overwhelming, but that alone is insufficient to drive change. And you have a couple reasons for this. On one hand, obviously, there's a lot more money in politics. Citizens United created you know, kind of unlimited amounts on the industry side. But there's a citizen activism side of this. And it's activism not in the sense of just the, those folks that are most engaged, but a sense of citizen involvement and passion and belief in the need for these issues to be more, more relevant and actually be higher priorities for all, for all of the, the, everyone stepping into the voting booth. By not having that level of civic engagement, all of a sudden, politicians can vote against these issues all over and over again at every level of government without much repercussion. And so the question that I'm going to present today is, looking across three or four different policy areas and, and kind of issue areas, um, how do we kind of begin to evolve a political landscape that is not really set up for any kind of collective action? So my mouth actually shutting with saliva is actually the only thing that slows me down. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. <laughs> So I used, I used to joke that growing up in Syracuse was good training in some ways because it does force you to get your ideas out quickly, but it's bad because if you, if you get going too fast, it actually either freezes or shuts shut. Um, there's four challenges that I kind of want to use. It's kind of a framework, if you will, for how to think about these issues. And I want to talk about the way that I think about them. And I'd love to have some back and forth about whether you think this is a helpful framework to think about these kind of citizen ethical issues for collective action challenges like the environment. And I would argue at the beginning that the environment is one area that government has to play a role. But there's things like education, collective defense, transportation infrastructure, and I would put environment there because it's, this, it's the type of resource issue that no individual can actually be steward of by themselves. Right? You can't take care of a single lake unless you have one property owner for the entire thing, um, which we try not to let happen in this country. We shouldn't, we, we, you, can't, you need government action at the local, state, and federal level. And so it is, it is one of those areas um, that I think is absolutely essential. And so the areas that I want to highlight on, I do want to talk about climate mitigation, um, talking about reducing emissions. And this is exceptionally complicated because the Clean Air Act originally focused primarily on the big smokestacks, right? The big nasty factories. When you think about like the smog in like, you know, the LA or the pictures of Houston or even in the, in the Rust Belt in the 70s and 80s, you know, when, when Ed Muskie passed the Clean Water Act with the help of with Senator Baker, a Republican from, from Tennessee. And you know, kind of, I mean, when you think about those big, those big pieces of landmark legislation, the problems were all completely visible, right? You could, you could see the smog. Now we're going to things like, like carbon dioxide, not as visible. We're going to things like mercury and, and kind of the, the, next, the, the next granular amounts of, of oxides and nitrogen or, or ozone, forming, ozone forming pollutants, things that aren't necessarily as readily visible and don't seem as much of a priority, but are nonetheless harmful to our public health. 
Um, I also want to talk about adaptation um, for just a little bit and talk about how, again, this is community by community work. This is not work that you can simply just pass a law and scale. How do you make a community like Syracuse more resilient? How do you make my current home state of Delaware more resilient when you're seeing more extreme storms, more temperature fluctuations, rising temperatures, invasive species? How do you think about these things in a way that is, that is both ethically responsible to the existing challenges and different populations that are at risk, as well as future generations and kind of being fair to them. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about species. Um, there's a bit of a crisis coming down the pipeline right now in this country around exter extermination of, of many species and extinction of many species, more appropriately. Um, there's about 1,100 species that are kind of in the pipeline for the Fish and Wildlife Service to consider in the next few years for whether they should be listed under the Endangered Species Act. You know, and I want to talk a little bit about the reasons we're having that face, part of which is climate, a lot of which is a lack of investment, a lot of ha lack of habitat investment. But I want to talk about that through a couple lenses then. I've already mentioned kids, but this idea of having a conservation ethic for the next generation is exceptionally important to everything that we believe, um, I believe, is, is necessary to overcome the incredible crisis um, that we will be facing around having a much more a much more responsible approach to, to taking care of our climate. And frankly, I think this is our generation's, this is our generation's kind of fascism or our ch the challenge for our generation. So before I get to those four, I do want to talk a little bit more about the political landscape because a lot of times in classes, it's very easy simply to talk about the problems and talk about policy solutions and talk about the science. But the translational ability to take these big problems and actually be able to then translate them onto a political landscape that is shifting very, very quickly in this country is an incredibly important skill. Um, I had a chance to meet with about 20 students earlier today, and I argue that if you want to make yourself employable, like actually thinking through the ability to translate science into policy and policy into political action and understanding the economics of all of that is exceptionally important and exceptionally rare. There are very few scientists in this country that actually speak like policy English, right? And actually, and very fewer of that that can speak any kind of political, political speak at all. And so the understanding how these things fit together, so understanding the landscape, um, I believe is exceptionally important. So one of the first things is, um, I like to joke often that uh, all Americans think of themselves as libertarians until they need help, right? So everyone's a libertarian until all of a sudden you know, they need Social Security or they need Medicare or they want to you know, keep your hands off those kind of things as the, as the, the sign, sign went a couple years ago. Um, you know, when, a, when a storm ravages a community, all of a sudden folks that have been voting against taxes and voting against um, any kind of form of government all of a sudden are asking, where's my check, where's my help? And so this libertarian ethic is not something we should try to overcome. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I think you, there's a case to be made for government. Um, I think Democrats and Republicans have been running away from defending government for way too long, buying into this talking point the era of government is over. Um, but at the same time, you're not going to necessarily win hearts and minds until we restore confidence in the ability of institutions to actually deliver results. So the libertarian ethic, and the challenge with the libertarian ethic that we see more and more pervading our politics is that it does prioritize short-term action over long-term sustainability. And sustainability not necessarily in an environmental sense, but in economic, social, and environmental sense. Um, because it does kind of put focus on short-term profits, short-term actions, and really trying to appease and get to the next, the next electoral cycle. The second point on the, on the landscape I would like to highlight is that we do have a generally unengaged citizenry in, the, in this topic area. You know, fishing license and hunting license are at all-time lows. Those numbers continue to go down. You see more folks birding, but they tend to be fairly white, fairly upper class. A lot of folks that live in cities uh, haven't had the same amount of access or same amount of priority. And then you overlay on top of that lack of parents actually caring about these issues. And all of a sudden, you sort of have a perfect storm. And this is why you're seeing fights in states like West Virginia and Texas and others trying to remove things like climate science from curricula because all of a sudden, there isn't a constituency to actually defend having sound science be in, in those kind of textbooks. So this generally unengaged citizenry on these issues. And I I think this is not simply a, a function of a, a failure of government. It actually gets at a deeper issue about our disconnect from the land and the fact that we don't have this land ethic. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we solve it later, but I do think that schools play an incredibly important role. If parents aren't able to connect folks with nature, we need to figure out ways to get them. And the best vehicle to do that is, is schools and then maybe nonprofits to a lesser extent. And then also think about the previous generation. Think about how we connect folks to grandparents and others that had those experiences. The, the next area I do want to highlight is, and it gets back to the libertarian, um, it's kind of the, the flip side of the libertarian point I made, which is around distrust of institutions. There is an incredible, if you look at the last election results, it was as much about distrust of institutions and a belief that nobody can get anything done in politics as it was about Democrats and Republicans. And so when you come with something that requires collective action solutions, right, trying to reduce non-point source or runoff water pollution to, to clean up the Great Lakes, for example, um, if you don't trust the institutions, whether that's local, state, or federal, to, that can get anything done, why would you trust that a government solution would make sense? So there's actually a re restoration of confidence in government to solve big problems. And I'll talk about some strategies around starting small and then getting bigger for that. And then also, the, and I mentioned this just briefly before, but the role of money um, and the disinformation around these issues, I think is one of the most toxic, possibly borderline treasonous actions that we've seen in this country in a long time. 
And it's treasonous in that there's an intergenerational theft that does occur when you're basically trying to convince folks that something is not, not harmful to them in future generations when in fact you know that it is and your own scientists are telling you that it is. Now I think the left has overplayed their hand. This is not an indictment on kind of one side or the other. But I, I do think that, that, that there's a disservice. And, it, and have that, that role of money come into play at a time when the role of the media is actually probably tougher, more tough media environment than any time before. We don't have the Ed Morrows and the Cronkites. Obviously, the Brian Williams story is hot right now. But there aren't those trusted figures. So all of a sudden, you can read whatever news you want. If you want to just read conservative news, you can read that. If you just want liberal news, you can get that. There is no arbiter of what is actually honest and truthful. Um, and this is a huge challenge when you're trying to get scientific information out at scale in a meaningful way. And so kind of thinking through how we overcome that. And, you know, and then the Twitterverse, I'm sorry, is not the answer to overcoming all of this. The, you know, Facebook isn't. But actually getting sound science presented in a way that is, that is validated by folks that are trusted messengers is going to be incre incredibly important for us to overcome these challenges in the years ahead. So I don't want folks to be intimidated by that landscape, but that is the landscape that we're facing right now. Right now there are 30 state legislatures across this country that have both chambers run by Republicans. There are 31 Republican governors, only 18 Democrats. Um, you obviously have record margins um, in the House, and I think, think since 1918, um, in the House of Representatives, a 10-vote margin in the Senate. Um, and that's not suggesting anyway there aren't conservation-minded Republicans, but the, inter the party constraints and the financial constraints from folks just kind of stepping out and being progressive on these issues, or being kind of responsive on these issues, those incentives aren't there, particularly when they're not convinced they're going to be rewarded with equal numbers of votes for the potential money they might lose. And so you know, the, the, the challenges are many. Like The landscape is actually fairly well tilted um, against meaningful action this way. And this is one of the reasons why you've seen such incredible leadership coming out of the White House with so many executive actions, um, where they're trying to do everything they possibly can under the Clean Air Act, using the, the Antiquities Act, using um, other, other kind of bedrock laws as ways to try to move these conversations forward. That the challenge is the more you use executive authority, maybe outside of the rulemaking to some extent, but a lot of that can be undone equally quickly. And so kind of thinking through how this all plays together um, creates an incredibly challenging landscape to think about big scale systematic change to the challenges I mentioned. Now, at the same time, I do think it's important to think through kind of a philosophical framework for how we think about these problems in the context of this landscape. And so I don't know if many of you have had a chance to study philosophy. I'll give you some kind of cookie cutter philosophy or cookie uh, uh, fortune cookie kind of uh, philosophy right now to kind of cribs of just kind of my three, the three philosophers I draw the most from in my day-to-day -day work. Um, and the first one is kind of John Stuart Mill and his view of utilitarianism. And this is important to kind of acknowledge because this idea is you do the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people or are you trying to kind of solve to some kind of absolute? And so this idea, and so when we think of species, often we kind of use utilitarian arguments saying, hey, if we protect this habitat, we can protect the most number of species, we can propagate it to sustainable levels. Um, but again, this kind of idea that, um, that numbers matter and that, that the kind of getting to the, the, get, helping the most people with the, with the resources is the best way to do it. Um, on the flip side of that, you have Immanuel Kant, obviously talking more about categorical imperatives. Are there things that folks should never have to live without? For example, like, are things like clean water and clean air and a healthy climate, are they a right? Um, they've never been enshrined in many, not obviously in federal um, constitutions in many, many places. A couple state constitutions have them in rights, but very few act on them as such. Um, but again, are there things like the, the breathing of a neurotoxin, like a mercury, um, is that something that you have an absolute right against? Or is it kind of a, something that's kind of negotiated um, through, a, through a regulatory process? And then also, the, um, the other philosopher I, I draw on a lot is John Rawls, um, who came up with a concept of called the, the, ve the veil of ignorance, if you will. Um, this idea that if you did not know who you were, that doesn't make any sense. If you didn't know kind of where you're going to be born into the world, if you didn't know you're going to be born in America or born into a family of privilege or born into a place where a life that allowed you to go to a great school like Maxwell, um, and you could be anywhere. You're, you could have been born anywhere in the world. You could have been born in the slums of Calcutta or you could have been born on the top of the pyramid in the U.S. If you did not know where in that, where in that trajectory you would line up, how would you design the world? How would you design policy? Because I think a lot of times right now, and this is particularly true, I think, in legislative bodies, the lack of, ability, lack of ability to empathize with those least fortunate um, is increasingly a problem as you see greater wealth stratification in the U.S. Um, and you also, you know, you kind of see Gini coefficients or, you know, you kind of see inequities kind of growing. And so this, in, this inability to kind of understand how it affects folks um, at all levels, I think, is incredibly, incredibly underappreciated skill and something we are sorely lacking, particularly around climate and species issues and, and actually all environmental issues for that matter. So with that, that frame, and I know that's a lot to kind of pour at people I know I talk too quickly, um, but I do want to talk about a couple examples of how these, this kind of thinking um, and these kind of various attributes do play out in very real ways. On, on August 2nd of last year, the, uh, the city of Toledo, Ohio, faced an algal bloom, um, a, a micro, called a microcystin, a microcystis um, algal bloom, that overtook their water intake. 
and this is about a mile, mile and a half outside the t t city of Toledo. Um, algal blooms have been a big problem in, in Lake Erie for a long time. Originally, it was more about like sewer pollution and, and wastewater treatment plants, but over time, now it's more about runoff. And so about 80, 70 to 80 percent of the pollution is coming from farm fields along this Maume River. Is anybody from Ohio here? Is anybody from that part of the guy? Just one? Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, no, no, sorry, you're the only one. That's why you're from Ohio. I just want to make that clear. Okay, okay, good. Um, <laughs> the, 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 so you have half a million people in the, greater, in the greater area, so this is Toledo and Oakland and some of the other communities, Oakland, Ohio, um, some of the other communities that don't have access to safe drinking water for about three days. And the initial focus was entirely about how do we get enough bottled water. And so I happened to be up in, um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so I drove down with you know, 200 cases of water or whatever with a buddy of mine in our, in our F1, uh, F150. Um, and, um, and we drove down and saw in all the conversations from all the politicians was about, okay, how do we get the distribution lines working? How do we get the National Guard to get the water to who needs it? How do we make sure that low-income folks that are at risk are getting what they need, seniors and, and the like? Which is great, a completely the appropriate response. A guy named Mayor Collins who just passed away a couple weeks ago, um, God rest his soul, he's an amazing man, um, orchestrated it perfectly. But nowhere in that conversation was about how do we actually avoid the problem. Um, and very little other than the city officials in Toledo were willing to engage because it's a very sticky issue. Right, all of a sudden you're dealing with farm runoff, you know, primarily dealing with phosphorus runoff, primarily coming from corn. Corn has exploded as a result of both commodity prices increasing. You've seen a lot, a lot of increase, in, uh, a lot of increased um, out, uh, output needed because of ethanol. The ethanol mandate as that continues to ramp up, and so all of a sudden a lot of marginal lands that weren't farmed before all of a sudden are, are going into production. You're losing the, the, a lot of the wetlands along you know, secondary streams that aren't currently regulated, but hopefully will be soon. Um, that all of a sudden aren't, aren't, aren't being protected and are being plowed over and being, being developed. And so you're losing your buffer strips, you're losing all these different entities. And you also have some policies that are just crazy, like actually applying um, manure onto frozen land. So you kind of get ahead of the game, but if you get a rain or something early, all of a sudden all that washes off. And that, that's been banned in places like New York and the Chesapeake region for, for a long, quite some time. Um, so you have all these different policy issues, but yet the legislature's still in session and a couple bills get introduced, there's a little bit of debate here and there, but for the most part, there's no action. Now, the politics are complicated. It's a fairly Democratic area, a fairly Republican legislature at this point. Most of the folks that were affected, heavy African-American population affected. Um, you know, kids, it was so bad that you couldn't actually, it's, a, it's a, the type of toxin that, are, uh, that you actually can't boil it away. Um, so it's not like when you go camp and you boil the water. Like you can't bathe in it, you can't, you, can't, you can't cook your food in it, you can't do any of those things. I mean, it's that toxic. And so at the same time, um, the, most of the folks that were affected um, you know, the ones that didn't have their own you know, private well or didn't have their own bottled water service or didn't have other things. And so the folks that were, that were most affected were the folks with the least political voice. And so six months passed and nothing happened. There was, like a, there was a committee, there was a task force, there was a, you know, some debate in the legislature, but nothing got done. And so you know, we went in fairly big with the National Wildlife Federation and began to demand solutions. Now every scientist has been saying we need to reduce phosphorus levels by 40%. Um, you know, we need to be able to we need to be able to reduce, you know, we need to reduce, increase buffers and reduce the amount coming off these farm fields. There's still some additional reductions that we need from wastewater treatment plants and, and runoff from more urban sites and golf courses and the like. Um, but it was amazing to me how this, this, what should have been a catalytic event, became a couple day story. The national news wasn't really even interested. Um, it kind of fell at a bad time. There was a, a UN school somewhere that got blown up at the same time, which is tragic. Um, but didn't get a lot of national coverage. It was half a million people, right? Half a million people in the US in 2014 couldn't drink water for three days. And so when you start thinking through, you know, kind of the various philosophical, you know, kind of frames that I mentioned and the, and the landscape, so the politics kind of oppose action. The primary contributors in this case are agriculture, very closely tied with the party in power in the state of, in the state of Ohio. No one wants to kind of, no one wants to necessarily kind of ring that bell, no pun intended, I mean, pick, up, pick that fight unless there's kind of a clear path forward and there's more buy-in. Um, and the folks that are most affected are those kind of least likely to have a political voice at the table. And so right now, we're actually working very closely with Governor Kasich and really making this case. And, and he's actually put some more money in his budget um, to try to address part of the problem. We're actually pushing him to kind of go a little further, hopefully. The legislature's talking about bills. But it shouldn't take a national organization and some bunch of local organizations to have to come into the mix to get folks to kind of do the right thing. And I'm not saying they wouldn't have otherwise, but it wouldn't have been at the speed that it, it's hopefully that it will be. And the reason I bring this up is that this gets back to an informed citizenry and an ability to actually empathize with other folks, because I, I do feel like Ohio is a little, a little bit like the entire state of New York, um, in that folks don't necessarily view themselves always as part of one state, right? So if something happens in upstate, I'm not sure somebody in Manhattan is going to be like, oh yeah, let me help with that problem, let me sacrifice in some way to help that, help that challenge be addressed. And it's a little like that in Northwest Ohio, where folks in Columbus or Cincinnati or, or Cleveland all of a sudden kind of see it as over there, as opposed to thinking about the indicative nature of and the, indi the indicative nature of the of the actual challenge and how it is something that could happen to them, whether it's in the Ohio River Valley or looking up. 
on a different part of the Great Lakes. And so when you think about this from a citizen point of view, the lack of, the, lack of the, the amount of distance from what folks actually know about kind of why water quality is the way it is and, and the ability to act upon kind of calling for solutions is vast. You know, there aren't a lot of folks in going to a legislator saying, like, we need to reduce non-point source pollution by some pounds, pounds per, pounds per um, you know, some amount of pounds to get to some kind of number. That's not something that's easy. And we haven't made it easy for the, the conservation groups to help people make that case in an actively kind of informed way. And so again, this is something that requires collective, collective action um, that we're going to need a way to figure out to engage folks to say, like, this could be your water supply together. This could be your water supply tomorrow and easily engage them in that, in that way. Another example that's a little, so hope, I'm hopeful about that, that example. Um, I think it does get to a good place eventually. The politics are complicated, particularly with some folks looking at running for president. But it is a, there is a potential for a, a, a really great story to come out of that. Um, but again, the, 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 the lack of citizen involvement outside of the immediately affected area is something that I'm very concerned about because it was not like a, this, is a, this is an Ohio issue, this is an issue that we need to address as a state. It very much was a regional issue. And so again, this idea of like, you know, a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it. If a tree falls in somebody else's forest, do you care? So again, just kind of think about how these things are connected. Um, and then the postscript on that is actually, it's gonna get worse before it gets better because as you see more storms and more precipitation because of climate impacts, um, you, see more, you see more water volume, more phosphorus is gonna run off. It's more, mainly phosphorus, not so much nitrogen. More phosphorus is gonna run off, making the problems much, more wor much worse and much more intractable in terms of quantity in the water column. The second example I use is actually a hometown example, um, one that I'm, I'm actually really excited about and something that you know, a couple of us in the room have been talking about for a long time. But there was a proposal on the, uh, the books for a long time here that the way to clean up Onondaga Lake was to basically build a series of wastewater treatment plants in one of some of the lowest income uh, zip codes in the entire city. Um, an absolutely abominable plan. And Minch was speaking out about this years ago, and Ann was speaking out about it, and Andy helped come up with the final solution. And Joni Mahoney, who's the county executive, was a Democrat, worked with Mayor Driscoll, who's a Democrat, or, or sorry, Joni is a Republican. I always forget that. Um, who, <laughs> sorry, Joni. Um, and Matt Driscoll was a Democrat, and Stephanie Miner was a Democrat. And there was this plan that was on the book. There was, it was almost like this tanker coming at this community, right? Where it's like, the only way we can address this problem is have this you know, massive half billion dollar expenditure of, of money to build these wastewater treatment plants to clean up the pollution. Everyone just happened to be in a poor neighborhood, most of which were African American. And there were a group of folks that basically said, no, there has to be a better way. And, and it, was, it was interesting watching the politics and how elections matter. Because when Joni Mahoney became a county executive, one of the first things that she did, she said, I want an alternative. I want to see an alternative. It's a county-led project. County is responsible for this kind of water project. And all of a sudden, the Save the Rain campaign that many of you have heard about, um, all of a sudden moved to a green infrastructure solution. But one of the reasons that stage was set, so that's the very political answer for why that kind of change happened. The, real, the, the, the truth, though, is for years before that, folks in neighborhood associations and these strong neighborhood initiative kind of communities, um, these strong, I can't remember what they were called, the, the, these neighborhood associations had a great name. That Bernardi was really good at naming things in Syracuse. Um, TNT, the Tomorrow's Neighborhood Today, that's right. Um, and, all these, and all these groups were furious about this project for years. They all hated it. They all knew it was going to be bad for them. They knew it was going to make their communities less attractive, less attractive for investment, less attractive for, for kids. And so they had stayed at it. They were incredibly engaged. Now, the reason I bring that example up after the Toledo example is that because there was a tangible project that was kind of barreling down on these communities and there was citizen activism that was already engaged, all of a sudden when you had the right leader come in, the right combination of leaders come in, you could actually move. You could move mountains pretty quickly. Now, contrast with the Toledo example where we didn't have that kind of citizen engagement before this issue because there really was no reason to in the same case. So the point I'm trying to make here is that figuring out local issues that are salient that also connect to these bigger national or international issues is incredibly important. Because I would argue for the last 50 years, for last, sorry, 15 years, we have framed the climate question as badly as we possibly can. Because we keep talking about ice sheets and polar bears and the Maldives and you know, other islands that most folks can't ever afford to even think about going to. Instead of talking about impacts on their own backyard, impacts to their drinking water supply, impact to their, how their storms are going to be affected, impacts on the wildlife they love, you know, the impacts on you know, their, their ability to go trout fishing, their ability to hunt a moose up in New Hampshire. Um, by disconnecting it from local concerns, We've made it an abstract academic conversation. And so when we, when we talk about things like you know, bee populations dying off, or talk about things like the monarch population dying off, I mean, these are challenges that are incredibly complicated. There are climate touch points on all these, but not necessarily always driven just by climate. Um, but these are, these are incredibly challenging issues that require citizen activism and not just like kind of one size fits all silver bullet government solutions. And so, you know, you think about the same thing going on like in the Gulf right now with BP having to, you know, clean up, use their, use the, BP's kind of fighting the, the legal settlement as they're trying to figure out the final, final restitution for the, for the oil spill there that was five years ago this April. Um, you know, is it going to be 13 billion or 10 billion? What's the natural resources damage assessment um, value of that? I mean, it could be $20 billion of investment in the Gulf. 
Now the question is going to be how much of that goes to restoration. Legally, they only have to put 30% towards it. I would argue it should be 80 or 90%. Now, the, the best thing for the short-term economy is go build a bunch of stuff. Go, let's go build some casinos. Let's go build some, let's go build some river boats, and let's go build some convention centers. The best thing for the actual region is to make as resilient a coastline as possible to make sure that as storms are coming through, these communities, particularly low-income communities, that many of which are along the coast, aren't kind of right in the crosshairs um, as these storms are barreling down on them. This is a huge debate. Now, the power in this case is devolved to the governor, so we're working hard with governors and local communities to try to make this case. But this intergenerational intergener inequity um, is extremely challenging when you've got folks that are trying to run for re-election in two years versus folks that are trying to make sure that a community is resilient enough to let their kid come back and live there. So again, you know, kind of thinking through these ethical issues um, should be front and center in policymaking, but so often it's kind of pushed to the back. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk just la lastly about a couple um, species that I do think um, could be kind of a new rallying cry, a new paradigm for thinking through um, kind of how we, how we think about the climate crisis and also kind of habitat crises across this country. Um, the first one is the moose. Um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to see a moose in like Michigan or my, has anyone seen a moose here in, in person? Oh yeah, that's good. Um, it's actually more than, I, more than I usually get when I ask that question. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and for a lot of folks, it's kind of the seminal experience when you're growing up and you go up to New Hampshire or Maine or you're in Michigan or, or maybe, maybe even um, Minnesota or Wisconsin. Um, the moose populations are cratering, you know, down 50% in some cases. And there's, some, there's, different, there's different impacts, one, but one of which is tick populations, winter tick populations that aren't dying off. So all of a sudden they get these ticks that are basically sucking the lifeblood out of them, literally. Um, and they're not dying off, they're getting more and more of them in, and so they're basically being drained from the outside in, or from the inside out. And now, the interesting thing in my organization is that we, we see kind of over and over again that the first folks that are on the front lines of this fight are the hunters that not necessarily want to catch a moose um, or take a moose, I mean, but they're just very concerned about the sustainability of the population. So in, Massachusetts, sorry, in, in, um, in New Hampshire or in, in Michigan, right now in Michigan, they actually had to ban the moose hunt. Um, there aren't enough to have a sustainable harvest. You know, for the first time, so folks are terrified about what this means for the state, for the tourism economy, for the, the, the sustainability of the habitat, the investments. In New Hampshire, they're kind of on the precipice right now. And the reason I bring that up is that all of a sudden, instead of leading with a polar bear, if we had led with a moose in those parts of the country, all of a sudden, everybody could relate to it immediately. As opposed to having something that you maybe see in a zoo occasionally or a stuffed one in like some kind of a horrible lodge, um, <laughs> it's something that people can relate to. And all of a sudden, now there's a call to action that can come from that, right? Because all of a sudden, it's like, well, hang on. If we, do, if we reduce emissions over here, maybe create some more habitat there, and all of a sudden now we're part of a local solution, it's not so overwhelming that you feel powerless to act. And I'm hoping that's one big lesson that should come out of this. The, the whole like act locally, think globally, is, it's, it's trite, but it actually matters. I mean, what we need right now in this country is a series of individual actions and community actions that can be scaled up. Not gonna be the same everywhere, but it's actually just showing that institutions can work, right? That a city that wants to help restore monarch habitat can do so and actually have backyard habitats and have you know, transportation quarters and things like that to create you know, the milkweed habitat that's necessary to make sure that your stepping stone along that journey from, from, from Mexico all the way to Canada, Canada is a healthy stop along the way. Now, this is, a, this is a daunting thing, it's very easy to say. But you know, I believe very strongly that if you actually work on these individual kind of community level issues um, and then can tie them to how this fits into a broader case. So like the case of, in the case of the Great Lakes, you talk about Northwest Lake Erie, but at the same time it's connected to a nationwide water issue with both water quality, water quantity, resiliency, and climate. You know, it connects to something that's, that's bigger than that individual, that individual problem. We've tried to go the other way, right? We've tried to go top down, and this is why it's become more academic. So the example that I'll, I'll end with is talking about monarchs. Because they're, they're, the reason for the plight of the monarch butterfly, which has gone from having almost a, hundred, or almost a billion um, kind of in the, in the flyway annually to probably less than probably 50 to 60 million are the kind of the best estimates for the last couple of years, is a series of factors, right? You have habitat losses in the overwintering habitat that's in Mexico. And so you've had impacts from pesticides and herbicides. You've had deforestation. So you've had issues down in the central habitat. If you think of the U.S. kind of as a funnel, kind of up through Mexico, through, through Texas, and then kind of out, um, you know, you've lost habitat up the entire quarter. You've lost conservation reserve program funding through the Farm Bill that actually encouraged folks to conserve lands, kind of a buffer lands on, on various ag plots. You've had commodity prices pushing folks further. You've had more herbicides, folks trying to, you know, kill every weed they possibly, kind of quote unquote weed they possibly can as a way to try to get additional acres in, 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 into production so they can make more money. Um, you've had a loss of urban habitat. You've had folks decide that it's not, it's not attractive enough, so therefore they're planting their you know, invasive um, non-native species instead of planting you know, native habitat. And then you also, and you've also had impacts from pesticides and herbicides and, and the like. And so you kind of put that storm together, and we've lost somewhere probably more than 100 million acres 
of habitat for monarch butterflies across the across the central corridor. And a lot of it's a lot of which is in that central that I-35 corridor. If any of you guys are Midwesterners, kind of from Laredo, Texas, up to Duluth, Minnesota, and everywhere in between, the only way to bring that back is a massive push on creating habitat. Right? I mean, we'll work with we'll make sure that you know, EPA is trying to, re or the Environmental Protection Agency is reducing the impact of some pesticides on different populations. There's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll mix it up with some of the chemical producers um, and try to get folks to do less impactful things. But at the end of the day, even if you did all those things tomorrow, you still have a habitat deficit. And so when you look at the, some of you have read the book, The Sixth Extinction, um, you know, and, and that book focused so heavily on the kind of the climate impacts. In a way, the habitat deficit in this country is actually overwhelming. And so I spend a ton of my time trying to figure out how do you create habitat everywhere? Of course there's big places. Like if you want to bring back bison populations like we're trying to in Montana, you need big tracts of land. Right? There's no way around. They're gigantic animals. So we're trying to connect you know, 3 million acres of land. But if you want to help bee populations, if you want to help monarch populations, if you want to help, if you want to help bat populations, there are things that you can do in your, in your own backyard. And individually they're not enough. But collectively they're pretty powerful. And so if you start with the ethical frames that I gave you, kind of thinking through how do you help the most people or are there things that absolutely no one should have to live with or you know, how would you design the world if you didn't know where you were going to sit in it. And then you combine it with this belief that you, if you can instill, instill confidence in collective action and actually bring institutions back to the, the forefront and back to prominence in some way as a way to actually drive meaningful change, then you can actually begin to change the world. And our generation is going to need nothing short of that. You know, the, the lessons for me are pretty simple, and a lot of them are instilled in me in this building and even this room in some cases. You know, ethics matter. You know, you have to have a, a compass. Because right now, I mean, there's a lot of folks flying under the assumption that uh, it's okay because it's, you know, for corporate profits or it's because of ideology or things like that. There has to be boundaries to that, that conversation. Um, and I think this is as good a place as anywhere to test those and kind of figure out where you fit on that spectrum. Um, citizens matter, but the only way to be relevant with citizens is to be salient. And the only way to get there is to make sure we're connecting these big issues to things that they care about in their backyard. Um, there was a mayor that in, of Syracuse a few years ago that used to like to talk about the 50-foot rule. That you know, folks always say, it's a Tom Young thing, right, I think? Um, they, they used to say that you know, folks like to say they care about these big international issues, but they really care about the 50 feet in front of their front yard. They care, is their, is their street safe? Are their kids safe when they go outside? They care about the school. They care about their backyard. They care, is there enough money coming in to pay the bills and hopefully maybe get somebody to college? These are issues that affect that dinner table conversation, right? Clean water, clean air, resilient communities, wildlife. I mean, these are things that affect every American's experience. And so to engage citizens, I think we need to do a better job actually being relevant and kind of showing how we're relevant and being less international and national and being much more authentic at the local level. Um, and the last thing is results. Results matter. Um, because right now, folks don't have confidence that we can get big things done as a country. I mean, this is a country that, you know, from, from the time that, you know, the time that Germany was on the march in the Second World War to you know, five years later when we were entering the, uh, or I guess eight years later, depending on what date you want to use, but from the time, that, from the time we started sending a few planes over to help Churchill um, to the time that the war ended, we basically went from having no air force in this country to the biggest in the, in the world. You know, we've designed entire industries you know, from scratch, a lot of times with government involvement on the front end. We have done big things throughout our entire time in this country. So this idea that anyone's going to say there's challenges that we can't face as Americans is absolutely ludicrous. And there's not a single person in our generation should, that should be willing to take it. Like we have a whole lot of politicians right now that say that we can't accomplish anything. And how those guys, at the end of the day, look at themselves knowing the history and the, the lineage that we come from is absolutely baffling. And so my challenge to all of you is that if you care about these issues, do something about it. Get involved in the game. It's nice to advocate from the sidelines, but actually like, the thing about the Maxwell School that I think is exceptionally unique is that you have an opportunity to have a seat at the table because of the skills that you're having. They're skills that not many other students have an opportunity to actually receive. And so I'm all for activism, and that's great. And sending a tweet before you go to bed is fantastic. We need folks that can get in the room and start making a change. I'm not looking for dispassionate, like qualified you know, folks that are basically just there to be automatons to do whatever, that, whatever the you know, policymakers say, but folks that bring their values, that bring their ideas, that bring their passion into the workplace. These are incredibly big challenges. We need government fun to function to solve them, but we need a robust citizenry to, uh, to have a to demand upon a government to actually implement these things at scale. And so if that's not something that inspires you for your work in this, of, over your career, I don't know what will. Um, but God knows we need you guys right now because these challenges are great and the, the time is running out. So thank you very much for having me today. So given that I've sat here for the and listen to this. Uh, I, want I, to take to the I want to take the, oh. the first opportunity to uh, ask you a question. You put, put a lot of things out there. I think there's a lot of things that we're thinking about at this point. But uh, let, me, let me put this out there and give us a little bit of sense. Because you say 
you know, you want people on the ground fighting, right? So we talk a lot about distrust of institutions. We talk about some libertarian paternalism coming forth, right, in, in how government decides to do some of these things. And you say we do a lot to sort of think about engaging other parties to address problems that have already taken place, that have sort of risen on the agenda to now be at a crisis stage. One of the things people often complain about when they hear collective action oriented talk is what are the incentives, right? And, and people say, well, you know, my motivations are different than yours, my preferences are different than yours. Yeah, there's a habitat deficit, but we don't care about butterflies anyway in my family, you know? So how, how do you sort of, what do you see in terms of how institutions, whether they be on the governmental side, the private side, and civil society, who, who's supposed to sort of get the ball rolling? And, and I say that as a guy now who has an institution who's trying to get that ball rolling in 50 different states, right? And so, so you know, you show up, let's say in Nebraska, you give an impassioned kind of speech that you just did. Audience loves it. And they leave. What comes next? How do you do that? How do you sort of set up that next piece? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I'll actually use the Nebraska example. Any Nebraskans here? <laughs> I, was, I was just there. Fantastic. I love Nebraska. Um, so I was, at the, uh, I was on the Platte River um, uh, giving, a, giving a speech, but I spent the day on the ground. And I think it actually comes back to, to, to listening to local priorities, right? I mean, because like, it, the thing that's interesting to me is that a lot of these national groups will come in and say, you should care about X, Y, and Z, as opposed to spending the first question saying, what's the biggest issue, what are the hottest issues in your community, right? I mean, if I came in, if I went into Oklahoma right now and basically said that your, your threat, three top priorities should be, you know, reducing carbon emissions and, you know, protecting some kind of habitat and, you know, maybe kids in nature. And they're saying, well, that's all great, but I got earthquakes going on because of the fracking fields that are next to, my, next to my house. And I'm concerned about the water being, you know, contaminated potentially because there's insufficient protection. Not that it can't be done safe, but it's just not being done safely right now. Um, you know, that's a very powerful answer that you got if you just ask the question. And so I was just in Nebraska, and I mean, and they're, they're, the, uh, Nebraska has actually less public land than almost any state in the country, except for maybe Texas, like Texas and, and Nebraska go back and forth. But these guys are really concerned about the resilience of the habitat of whooping cranes that go through like the Platte River Valley. And they're concerned about the erosion rates of the Missouri Valley, the Missouri River as it feeds into the, the Mississippi. And they're concerned about the loss of native grasslands in the, the western part of the state that are um, some of the most important habitats for things like prairie chickens and others. Um, I didn't know any of that sentence before I got there. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the whooping cream part. But actually going out and seeing it and seeing why they care. So if I can go in and say, look, these issues actually matter, and here are some tools for how to actually try to get them relevant at the local level, and here's a little bit of firepower behind the scenes to give you a little bit more juice, all of a sudden they're bought, and then if, then if I go back and say, you know, hey, that, that whooping crane issue that you're worried about, you know, can you guys work with the folks in Texas that also have some habitat that's similar to that so we can actually start talking about this corridor? And all of a sudden it's like, well, let's talk about the impact overseas. All of a sudden, they become part of a bigger. They become part of a bigger whole, a bigger challenge, and but it's because it's salient and relevant locally. And so, you know, maybe the maybe the the first bite of the apple is working with a you know the the parks district or the city council to try to make sure there's better habitat restoration for some small plot. If you get that done, then all of a sudden it's okay. Well, let's think a little bit bigger. So, like, what's the county doing? What's the state doing? What's but you need those early wins because right now folks don't have confidence. That their that their you know their activism quote unquote is undone and I think I made this point to some students earlier today. Um, our activism in this country has become so electronic that it's not having nearly the impact that people think. Right. So folks like they send a tweet, they all of a sudden feel like they're going to change the world, or they feel like if they you know post something nasty on Facebook or you know send an email, um, that's fine. It'll never be as impactful as the person that spends two minutes of face to face, face time with the principal. Like that'll stick in their mind. Or right? you get ask a question at a town hall meeting, or you get into somebody's office or fundraiser, whatever it is. Um, because that's what the member remembers, right? So somebody else is basically just a number on a sheet. And I mean, the social media stuff is huge. I mean, don't get me wrong. If somebody gets you know, 10,000 distinct emails or, or Facebook, uh, Facebook um, notes or messages on the wall or, or tweets, um, and they're from that state, like they're going to care. But it's not nearly as impactful, I think, as talking to people face to face. So I think those two things combined, focusing on the people and then focusing on manageable kind of change to kind of get the ball rolling. And then all of a sudden, you can scale up from there pretty quickly. So I know it's been only about seven months since you've taken over, seven, eight months since you've taken over NWF as the, as the principal leader. But as you think about these kind of cross-border, cross-state, cross-sectoral partnerships, how are you mobilizing that kind of participation? Yeah. Um, and water, it's easy. And air, it's complicated. And, and what I mean by that is at the end of the day, um, 
not easy, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of folks can rally around the great water bodies. Um, it's a little harder in headwaters um, when you, for example, like there's parts of like the Susquehanna River um, that plays in the Chesapeake Bay there in New York, and there's some parts of like the Delaware River that goes down kind of along Pennsylvania then into Delaware Bay that's, you know, only a slice, only a sliver of it's in New York. Um, and sometimes it's hard to convince folks that they should care because it's part of a bigger water body. Um, so in the case of the Delaware Bay, you know, it's an incredible estuary and it's an amazing body, but, you know, you're four hours away. And so the Chesapeake's kind of the same thing. Um, so I think there's cases where water can be hard, but it's, it, water is almost always easier than air. Um, part of that's because kind of the way pollution flows, um, obviously everything's always going downhill and downstream and on the water side. On the air side, you're actually talking about different, especially with transport issues, um, with air pollution blowing from like one state into another, typically goes west to east. Um, you're actually dealing with kind of underlying issues in the economy and structural issues um, in very complicated ways. So for example, when I was in Delaware, 90% um, of the pollution that we breathed on any, on any kind of bad air day was coming from out of state. I could have shut down every single factory, every single power plant, every single king, every single road off the car, uh, road, every single car off the road, and my daughter still would have had to breathe unhealthy air because of the amount of pollution coming from all the states to the west of us. Now, the challenge when you go to the governor of Indiana and you say, "Hey, we want you to put, you know, SCR or scrubbers on your on your on your coal stacks. We want you to do this and this that the East Coast states have already done under the ozone transport region agreements." Um, they look at you like you're crazy. Like our competitive advantage is our energy is cheaper than yours. Our manufacturing is cheaper than yours. Our labor is cheaper than yours. Why would we possibly do anything that's not going to benefit us locally, but it's just going to benefit you downstream? So then all of a sudden you try to figure out, well, how is this impactful locally? And then you, so then you have the conversation about, well, maybe there's particulate matter. So the kind of the, the, the dust, right? The, 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 the um, yeah, like the, the, the kind of the small particles that get in people's lungs. And you say, well, you should care because this, this part of the pollution isn't going that far. This part's mainly staying in your state. And then you look at the demographics of the, of the zip codes around the, of, around the power plant, around the factory, and you realize most of them are low-income communities. And so all of a sudden, like, there isn't the economic or, or there isn't the economic incentive because it maybe hurts manufacturing. There isn't the personal incentive unless you have someone fairly enlightened because they're not their people. Um, and so you know that's a very crass way to think about it. But I mean, it gets back to aligning incentives, and you have to figure out a way to make it competitive. And so one thing we would say is that you know well EPA is going to deal with this at some point. So you can deal with us in, through a negotiated settlement regionally, or you can face EPA in a much more potentially more confrontational way. Um, that didn't really work either, but EPA, then EPA came in. So um, it's a, uh, but it's one of those, it's one of those challenges that um, there are things where there's a common value. If you can talk about like the Great Lakes are the best example. Folks care about the Great Lakes as a value. It's not a partisan issue. Um, things like air quality, they're mainly concerned about their own. They're concerned about their economy. Much more difficult. And then you throw the climate overlay on top of that. Exceptionally complicated. Um, but it's a work in progress. But it gets back to why should they care locally? From why should the from the most crass, either political or personal reasons, why should they care? And if you can't cross that nut, you're not going to get very far initially. Thanks, Colin. We have some time for questions here. Bethany has a microphone. Brandon has a microphone. So we would be delighted if you would uh, you know, keep your question brief to make sure that enough people have an opportunity to ask questions. But questions. Brandon, we, I think we have one here. And I think we have one here. <laughs> Should be on? OK, cool. Um, how do you see, because I know our future generations are very important to focus on, but currently science education is really terrible um, in the US. How do you see us reconciling common core science education and getting kids outside? So um, unfortunately, I mean, the common core debate is so toxic at this point. I'm not sure it's resuscitatable, um, but I'm very, I'm very bullish on the next generation science standards. And, and there, there's some overlap there, but not completely. Um, when I was in Delaware, we did a survey of every lesson plan for fourth graders to 11th or 10th graders um, in like the general, general courses. There were about 450 different science lesson plans. Only five had any kind of outdoor element at all. Um, a lot had kind of environmental elements, but didn't have an outdoor component. We were able to take that number from five to 50 in the first year and five to 150 over two years. And so all of a sudden now a third of them in Delaware have that, that agreement, have that, have that component. Um, I do think the more that we're talking about science, STEM, the more we're talking about science, technology, engineering, and math, and the environmental education being part of all four of them, I'm so excited, um, <laughs> having, the, um, having, having a part of all four of those, um, and also opportunities to connect environmental literacy and conservation literacy to the social sciences and the humanities um, as examples, um, the better off we are. We need to stop thinking about it as a standalone thing, right? As a, almost like an elective is kind of how we talk about it. 
if it's just $50 million in the, in the EPA budget, which actually the president just put in, which we're very excited about, or it's you know, 30 million in NOAA's budget, instead of like the billion dollar science budget for like DOE or the you know, state level budgets, um, we will never get there through the small pots if we're also thought. So I'm doing things right now, I'm working with a bunch of states to have Ranger Rick, so we published Ranger Rick magazine, I don't know if you guys ever read that, so yay Ranger Rick. Um, I, I love when I say that, because everyone's like, I love Ranger Rick. Um, <laughs> We're trying to get a lot of our, we've, we've amazing, you know, 45 years worth of content um, that we're actually providing to schools right now, in many cases free of charge, to use in their lesson plans for reading comprehension in English classes. And so, you know, so all of a sudden now you got that nice crossover, there's good content. And so we're trying to figure out ways to fundraise for that to make it, make it bigger. Um, but I mean, I think those are the opportunities. And then you connect to the outdoor ed piece um, by being much more sensitive to kind of where you are in the country. So there's some places where it might be more of a hunting and fishing thing, some places it might be more about birding or, you know, but being somewhat sensitive to like those opportunities and then getting into the PE curriculum as, and, the, and the social studies curriculum for like, you know, the folks that still have a little bit of money for, for trips. I'm trying to do that. But I think there's huge opportunities. It's hugely bipartisan, too. I mean, this isn't, you know, the climate stuff gets a little dicier, but there's huge opportunities for bipartisan support because everyone wants to have a scientifically literate workforce and kids and everything else. So we just need to make it part of that conversation, not a standalone separate conversation. Um, so recently, um, you know, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has come forth and basically said that he's going to be waging war against like Obama's environmental agenda and kind of uh, lessening uh, the power of EPA. I was wondering, like, if you could speak about how your organization and maybe some other like national organizations are going to come together and kind of, I guess, block you know congressional Republicans from actually kind of undoing the progress that we have made and kind of creating you know more like progressive environmental like policies. Yeah. Um, so I have a friend of mine that talks to a lot of liberal audiences and he actually says occasionally he's like well some of my best friends are Democrats or some are Republicans sorry it would have been funny if I said Republicans. Um, I, I actually was a Republican um, and so I mean and I actually have some pretty you know moderate to conservative views on, on some of these things. Um, we need to stop thinking of them as our enemy. And so McConnell has said some, the majority leader has said some things that are very worrisome on EPA regulatory authorities, but there are other areas that we can work together. And there's also areas that we just have to stand strong. And beginning to differentiate between those, it's not a monolithic block. So I may mean, spend a lot of time talking to Republican senators who are very supportive of conservation measures that want to see you know, good incentives or you know, grant programs for various conservation programs like the Land and Water Conservation Fund, or the Farm Bill titles. Um, there's some folks that are decent on water issues, right? There's folks, I mean, we had five senators that just stood up and said, five Republicans that just stood up and said climate science is real and, and man-made. You had 15 that said it's real, and then a whole bunch of them that said something on a resolution that was not particularly well written. Um, but there are, you know, and so my thing is like, there's a big fight right now, not fight, but there's a big debate within, you know, some of the, some of the green groups. And we're kind of the most moderate to conservative of the green groups because of our hunter-angler kind of base. Um, our kind of constituencies, we're kind of fairly big tent. But you know, I'm very careful never to paint them with a broad brush, right? Because I mean, I do think, look, the, the, the Senate Majority Leader from Kentucky, of course, is going to be concerned about EPA regulations. Now, whether that translates into every other issue as a, as a salient thing, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, there's some, there's some rules like the clean water rule which we're going to have to defend, which I'm very worried about because it could be attached as a rider, and I'm not sure it's something we shut the government down over. Um, there's other things like Endangered Species Act or the Antiquities Act that I think they'll come after, but I don't think they have, they have a majority to kind of undo significant parts of it. You might say like individual species. But on the climate stuff, I mean, this president has been incredibly forceful. I think the, the, the marshalling of the entire federal family um, to enact the climate, um, the, really the, the climate action plan um, that the president announced at Georgetown a few years ago, and John Podesta's work behind the scenes to actually line up the federal family and have everyone kind of lockstep inside the administration. Um, I'm not worried about a sustaining of veto. I mean, if, so if, if, if they attach something to the clean power plan, the president's going to veto it. They don't have the 66 votes. I think we're solid almost at 42. I don't think they have 60. Um, to, to override it. So I'm not worried so much about the climate piece of that. I am worried about things like, like the ozone standard, but I'm not sure it's as strong. The clean water rule, I'm not sure everyone's as strong as the Endangered Species Act kind of riders and some of the, and some of the um, Antiquities Act riders. But the climate piece, the president's been incredible. I mean, his leadership on this issue, I think, is, it, just, it will go down as one of his greatest accomplishments in, in hindsight. Um, but the other pieces, you know, I think we have to stand ready for. And this is one of my big challenges as kind of the wildlife guy. Um, so many folks equate environmentalism to just to climate at this point. And there are other issues that all play into that, but are, are kind of attacked in different ways. And so we need to stand strong on all of it, um, find commonality where there is, and stand strong where, where there's not. So. so. Thank you very much for a great lecture. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I really wholeheartedly uh, approve uh, and endorse your um, discussion to 
have people focus on place-based approaches to a lot of problems. I think that's really essential and hasn't been looked at enough. Uh, where I depart, I think, from uh, some of the things you said is about youth involvement. Because actually, I think we're living during a time where there's a lot of youth involvement on environmental issues. You have youth in East Texas who have been protesting the Keystone Pipeline, really putting themselves on the line. You have youth tying themselves, zip tying themselves to the White House uh, fence. To, propose, to oppose the pipeline, and also Tim De Christophers, who's one of the best known probably environmentalists in the United States, also a youth uh, being actually sent to jail because of his civil disobedience. Now, I know the National Wildlife Federation also opposes the Keystone Pipeline, um, as does some of your sibling organizations, such as the Sierra Club. And for the first time in its 100-year history, you actually had leaders in the Sierra Club not only endorsing civil disobedience, uh, but being you know, sent off, at least briefly, to jail. So I would like to hear the National Wildlife Federation position on that. Is the National Wildlife Federation see at particular points a need to do that aspect of citizenship, that aspect of sacrifice, which we've been discussing here in the Maxwell School over the past couple of weeks? So, so your position on those aspects of civil disobedience and, and citizenship. Yeah, so um, there is a disagreement within the, the Green Group. I fall on the side that does not think that the best way to negotiate change and actually advocate for change is from a jail cell. Um, I, I fall on the side that I want to be in the room. I think it's important. I think 350.org has done incredible work across the country organizing. I think Sierra Club has done incredible work. But at the end of the day, decisions are made in the room. And I think you can create the space for negotiations by protesting. And you can, you make, you can make an issue relevant. You can make sure it's on the table. But those aren't the folks that typically are actually constructing kind of the policy future at the room. And so the National Wildlife Federation, because we tend to be more moderate, because we tend to you know, have more of a broad base, um, you know, I think we, we tend to be more focused on kind of the pragmatic solution. At the same time, like you said, like we have concerns about Keystone, but it's not necessarily the carbon content. We're, impact, we're concerned about the impact on the, actually the impacts in, in Nebraska, right? I mean, there's, and so on, on wildlife. And so I think our hook is always kind of through the wildlife lens. But I think at the end of the day, um, if, you, if you don't marry kind of involved, an outside game involved activism with a strong inside game having players both that are at the table, like you'll never get the progress that you want. And I think, you know, as you, you know, use the civil rights movement or like the gay rights movement as, as examples, like you need to institutionalize these things, right? I mean, it's great to have Martin Luther King, but if you don't have LBJ codifying things, like, you know, we don't have the Civil Rights Act. So, I mean, I do think that, you know, I tend to be more in that model than, than other folks like Mike Brune, but I think there's a need for both of it. And I think that the only way to make progress is to have so much engagement at all spectrums that there's enough noise around these issues that they're actually, they have to be dealt with. And then, you know, but I will always, I will always defer to trying to be in the room to try to be at the table. So you talk a lot about getting people to care. You just mentioned like a noise around an issue. Um, but I'm wondering if there are scenarios in which collective action and civic engagement isn't enough. So you know, if you look at um, industrial agriculture companies and the effects that you know, not only carbon emissions, but fertilizer runoff, like you mentioned with the algal blooms, and you know, obesity and diabetes rates based on what food is available to certain demographics. Um, that those issues are important to people, but are the players just too big and the companies and the money involved and the, the struggle in politics, it it's, makes it seem like, you know, no matter how many millions of people sign a petition online or whatever, or are, are arguing for these, is there just a need for top-down legislative action or have we just not seen those people in enough numbers? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, it's a, it's a good question because I think there are, there are some examples where the money is overwhelming. The only way to fight money is not necessarily money or kind of being a, being a, um, I don't know, kind of a, a poor copy of like the alternative. It's necessarily, it's actually used like citizens and voting blocks as actually force, right? Because right now, if somebody's afraid they're going to lose, you know, access to a million dollar super PAC if they vote a certain way, you know, the only reason they would choose that, right, is if they're convinced the electoral consequences of, of taking, the, taking that vote are that devastating to them. Now, I don't think we have those kind of numbers in most cases around these issues, so we haven't made that case. But, I mean, I do think that local involvement is, is still the, the let's, let's use your, let's use your um, childhood obesity one as an example, right? So you got Mayor Bloomberg that tried to say, look, it's kind of a quick fix government solution. Look, we're going to tax the externality, right? We're going to throw a tax on it. We're going to you know, get rid of big gulps. We're going we're to tax it, and that's going to be the answer. 
And I don't think anybody in that community, in his, in his administration, anticipated the Latino community and some others saying, well, hang on, like, you know, the other food's actually more expensive. Like, this is a way to get calories. And not in, in, in the low income, the WIC kind of, WIC, WIC kind of advocates. Um, why, why all of a sudden now, you know, this is actually kind of another poor tax in some ways. And all of a sudden, unless you make, unless you make food more plentiful and more available and more, more and cheaper to procure, all of a sudden now you're just creating another price impact on, on low income folks. Nobody in the Bloomberg administration, this gets back to having empathy and kind of knowing kind of your constituency. I don't think, I mean, the, the reactions from my friends that were in the administration, they were shocked that anyone was complaining about it. They're like, of course they're going to love this. Their kids are going to be healthier. Not realizing that when you're choosing between food and medicine, right, all of a sudden oh, that's not a good trade off. So this is like one of those examples where I don't think a big government solution can be the tip of the spear. But at the same time, we need to do a much better job connecting these dots. And corn is the example. I mean, folks in my staff get sick of me talking about corn. But between, right now, 27% of all corn in this country is going to fuel. It's just, just very challenging in many ways. Another big chunk is going towards making our kids fairly heavy. And so, I mean, I'm all for a diversified economy, but the economic incentives to grow more in ways that are more impactful on wildlife, more impactful on natural resources, fairly nutrient and, and kind of pesticide intensive, um, is very worrisome right now. The only way to have that fight, though, is to kind of really talk about crop diversification. How are folks on the other side, getting back to David's incentive conversation, how do we make it a bigger incentive for the farmer to diversify his crops to grow more of other, other crops so they can still make a living without having to come with some kind of government moratorium? When you try and do it, you're not going to win that fight. But just on the Senate alone, like you don't have the votes to try to like impose massive things. I mean, that's <laughs> big agriculture in the middle of the country, right? It will kill you. And so, I mean, I do think that we need to make the, the issues more relevant, but we, ha we can't be so quick to say like everything has to be like, you know, a government tax or like a government um, you know, moratorium. I mean, there have to be other solutions. But my guess is the average family has no idea what the impact of diet on, you know, these long-term health trends on their kids, or if they do, they would choose better alternatives if they had cheaper access to food or ex access and proximity in terms of food deserts, access in terms of quality, in terms of cost. Um, and so that's the way I tend, to, I tend to think about these things. But, you know, we don't have a citizenry that's, and I'll use the climate bill example. We don't have a citizen that's demanding action enough to make it make these kind of solutions even part, these kind of proposals even part of the debate yet. So until we do the legwork to kind of create the, the standing army of folks saying, look, this is ridiculous. Like this has to change, and have elect, have politicians that actually think that inaction on the issue is un unacceptable to their political future. I think it's very hard to kind of wind up with a one size fits all government solution. So. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you talked a lot about. Uh, doing a lot of groundwork and moving towards collective action and listening to local concerns. And you also talked a lot about um, educating children through outdoor ed and you know, uh, science-based education. Um, but my concern is a little bit about the, the donut hole between those. So if there's people today that um, you're, you want to engage uh, on a local level for their concern, but they're actually not totally aware of all the problems or they don't have the proper education to understand the implications of the policies, how can you expect to engage them in a way that will lead towards collective action that you're, you're seeking? So I'm sort of, I, I like the idea of the education on the, you know, for the children, that's always great. Who's against that? Um, but <laughs> but the, I'm more concerned about sort of jump-starting the voting age block of, of people um, because I'm, the more I, you know, research climate stuff, the more I feel like, in some ways, we're we're running out of time, and I, I don't want to wait 20 years to know that something is irreversible. So, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good it's a good question in that you know if folks don't have the basic level of kind of civic civic education around these issues, it's hard to like then kind of translate that into action. Um, I think where everyone can come to the table though is like where they see problems. Right, and so if you're concerned about the climate issue, and you're concerned about the em emission side. Working with your city council to actually, you know, change out every street light and change out every, you know, street signal, because all of a sudden that's going to reduce emissions by eight percent of the municipal, you know, of the, of the municipal the municipal facilities kind of emission profile by, you know, eight or ten percent. Like that's a meaningful change, and that's something that's going to pay for itself in eighteen months. And so, I mean, I do think I'm arming folks with solutions. But if you come to me with, hey, like this is a problem that I see, like. Organizations, local and national, can say like, look, these are the top three ideas we have for getting it done at the local level. Then it's just the legwork, and I think where where I struggle is, um, the legwork doesn't end with like the electronic communication, right? I mean, getting showing up to a committee meeting at you know Syracuse City Hall. I mean, I mean actually, you know, Stephanie and, and Mayor Driscoll before were pretty good on these kind of sustainability issues, but like having somebody you know say like, look, you know, we think we can help you reduce emissions by this way. Here's an idea. You know, I mean, you talk to somebody like Andy, right? I mean, Andy's running planning policy for the city and county right now. He's a Maxwell grad. He'd love to talk to you all the time because. And his email address is, um, but, 
<laughs> but 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 it's, but it's actually engaging because if, if you if you come to somebody say, if you went to the city council right and said hey this is a problem I'm really concerned about I'm concerned I'm concerned that the um, I'm certainly concerned that the water quality, you know, isn't good enough in my community. It's actually pretty good here because it's Canales Lake. But um, say, say, say there's an issue like that. Like just knowing that it's a problem that somebody cares about, they're going to dig in, right? Because they're going to turn around and call their staff or somebody's going to call somebody that works in that department and say, "Hey, can you get this guy information?" And then if they come back with unsatisfactory information, I mean, this is kind of civics 101, right? Kind of representative democracy. Like at the local level, you can actually drive action that way. And then if you don't get the answer you want, you bring 10 of your friends. You don't get 10, then you bring 100, right? I mean, like you just kind of ramp up. But I don't think. I don't think local place-based action has to be necessarily on global issues, right? I mean, I think on, and my thing, I'll take activism from anybody on kind of a broad range of conservation issues because if I get folks engaged, all of a sudden, like the chance of them kind of moving up that ladder of engagement towards like the bigger regional national issues becomes much easier than trying to take somebody that's not engaged at all right to the national stuff. Because um, they're going to get, they're going to enjoy progress along the way, right? And this thing kind of feeds itself, right? All of a sudden, you, you help keep a park open, or you help build a skate park, for example, right? All of a sudden, now you feel like you can get the next bigger thing done. So you kind of keep ramping up your your asks. So. Yep. Hi, um, I'm Adam Lee, I'm pursuing MPA here at the Maxwell School, okay. and I'm very glad to have your. I'm very glad to have you here talking about species and habitat conservation. I'm very much interested in that field, and I have been like um, working for the um, migratory water bird conservation right. in East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. But as you mentioned, it is not very. Um, it is an important um, issue, but it is very hard to catch people's like attention how important it is because it is not the top priority issue. So I was interested, I would like to ask you how that grabbed your attention to pursue your career path in, the, in conserving, uh, conservation. And I would also like to ask you if you are, if you'd be interested to dedicate your like, career life in this conservation field. Um, the first question is easier than the second question. Um, I think for me, I mean, growing up here in Syracuse, I grew up about 15 miles from here, I mean 10 miles. Um, you know, we at the time when I was growing up, the Onondaga Lake was considered one of the most polluted lakes in the country, and and there was you know fighting about how to fix it and this and that. Um, but the the companies that had polluted most of it had long gone, and so you know growing up, I told us to, to Stan earlier today. Um, you know, a lot of kids that I played baseball with, like in like you know the equivalent of Little League, the Optimist League, um, had moved away because their parents took jobs in North Carolina or whatever. I mean, they're friends that you know, so you didn't have the jobs in many cases, and you had the pollution. Um, and so trying to figure out how to fix that. I mean, my focus has always been how do you strengthen communities, right? Whether it's Syracuse or how do, you, how do you strengthen, how do you make, I mean, particularly kind of struggling cities stronger. And the, the epiphany that I had from being here and then really my, I mean, both a little bit in, in, in New Hampshire, but more importantly in England, um, this idea that you can actually use natural resource and kind of externality, kind of reducing externalities as a way to actually strengthen communities, to grow new industries, to diversify economies, to make yourself more attractive to tourists and to residents, and really kind of use that as a, as a catalyst for kind of jump-starting or kind of reigniting a, a community um, was incredibly powerful to me. And so then I went out to Silicon Valley where you know, the government's not particularly important in many ways, but you see pri the private sector doing a lot of this work, a lot of civic engagement, a lot of public-private partnerships. Um, and so for me, it was, it was that intersection. And so wildlife is the embodiment of that to me, because you know, and maybe we're talking about a lake here, and maybe I don't know, a great, great blue heron or something like that. Um, but wildlife is a way to crystallize and kind of send a signal that all that other stuff that supports that species, right? The clean water, good habitat, you know, abundant flyway or whatever the case is, um, all has to kind of stitch together. And so for me, I mean, if you have a healthy, if your species are doing well. We're doing well as a as a species ourselves, right? I mean, if, if all of our flyways are doing well, and you know, and right now every indicator is in the other direction, right? I mean, pretty much every species that we care about is plummeting, and you know, we're and we're and the invasives that we all hate are kind of on the on the on the charge, ticks and mosquitoes and the like. And so, if we use them as an indicator of our health as a as a species and as part of as part of you know kind of the global species, um, it's a great way to kind of think about how we get back into balance. And so for me, I mean, I don't know whether my future is staying in this. I mean, when if you told, if you asked Anne, who was my boss, you know, ten years ago, that I'd be sitting here as the wildlife guy, she would have been like, yeah, he occasionally went for hikes and like whatever, but she's shocked. And I think my dad would be equally shocked, even though I always liked this stuff. Um, I gave up the five-year plans a long time ago, but I know that this is the challenge for our generation. And if we don't overcome these challenges, um, there may not be, you know, much much behind us. And at the same time, if we don't do it in a way that's relevant, 
that we're not going to be we're not going to be impactful. And the best way I believe to be relevant is to be through the lens of wildlife and natural resources because it's much more potent and much more relevant whether you're working on migratory bird issues in Asia or you're working on restoring a lake here in Syracuse. So, so I'm a wildlife biologist, professor at ESF, um, and I'll add a moose biologist on top of that. Um, and and Did I get and that I, right, more or less. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I agree wholeheartedly that science is overwhelming in terms of species losses and the causes and 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 what needs to be done. And science is not in the room informing management and and policy at all. So, so what do you see the role of the academic researchers, the the scientists, in bridging that gap? Yeah. I mean, I often, I often say that we don't, have a, we don't have a science problem. We don't necessarily have a policy problem in this country. We have a connective problem from the time of getting that to implementation of the politics. Um, I do think translation matters. Um, and I think that a lot of folks feel that publication ends when the edition comes out. And you know, maybe they give a couple of lectures, but basically to their, to their colleagues. Um, I think you know, we're trying to do a better job getting things out. Um, you know, Audubon's been trying to get some stuff out, even though some of their stuff's been dated. Um, I mean, I, I do think that you know, working with like organizations like mine and others that can help help with that translational value to kind of get things wider spread. I mean, it's great. I mean, we do a good job getting out things that are in nature, but there's a million other journals that are equally important, that are equally impactful, that I don't think get nearly the prominence. Um, and I think in some ways, a combination of having the um, the environmental kind of reporting staff of a lot of entities, even at the national newspapers, and and you know, for every Ann Thompson at NBC, there's you know, there's not necessarily her counterpart. A lot of other a lot of other entities. I think working with our groups like ours and others to try to figure out what are those salient messages that could break through the noise and really kind of make this case. Because right now there's so much noise, right? I mean like, you know, one day, one month you're reading about bees, then you're reading about monarchs, then you're reading about moose, then you're reading about, you know, invasives. And I mean, there's just so much right now. I don't think people can understand it. I do think that the most powerful way to go about it though might actually be um, regional submarkets. And so you talk about what's relevant in that community. So moose are kind of iconic. They kind of, you know, play everywhere. But you go deep with a, a strong moose message in you know, the five or six states that have a lot of moose population or an economy built around it, that's an incredibly powerful message. And so I would love to work with anybody at ESF that wants to figure out ways to get their research out more broadly, um, particularly around these like, habitat and climate impacts. Because I, I do think that um, I'm going to be making a case very strongly over the next maybe 60 days or so that the, the bottleneck that we had, not the bottleneck, but the kind of the thundering herd of species in, that are going to be up for consideration or ESA, both from the courts and from kind of more traditional petitions, um, is basically a result of underinvesting through land and water and ESA and everything else for the last 40 years. And so, if you had, if you're spending, it's my it's my assumption based on some data that if you had about a billion to a billion and a half dollar of dedicated wildlife habitat money spent nationally, including all the state level things like that, you could actually get at most of the ESA issues in a non-regulatory way. Um, and and. The only way to make that case, though, is to work with folks like yourself that you know, have that, that level of data. But if all of a sudden we pitch to Republicans, for example, that, you know, look, you hate the ESA, but rather than blowing it up because the president's never going to let that happen, maybe there's a couple small tweaks, but we want to work with you to try to have ded some dedicated funding. We'll figure out the pay for it, but some dedicated funding to prevent future candidate listings, and maybe there's some kind of you know, consideration in the interim through some interim measures. I mean, that's a package that actually could get done um, conceivably in this, in this environment because they just hate the idea of these listings so much. But... Sage grouse right now. Sage grouse is going to dominate, you know, conversations for, and it has been for many years. It's a fifty to one hundred million dollar habitat problem. Most, of, and most of the money is needed to be spent on BLM land, on, on public lands, on Bureau of Land Management lands. And so, I mean, there's things like that that we can do in this kind of divided government environment that can have a huge benefit. But we need the sound science with the resource to actually go to implementation. So. Hi. Um, thank you for your work. Um, I really appreciate it. I agree with pretty much everything you said, but. Um, I have a question about what is the National Wildlife Federation doing to engage minorities? I know you talk about a lot how um, many many of the polluted, most polluted areas in the country are basically where minorities are located in most in most places. So what are you what are you doing to bring the minorities to the table through your important position? So I actually became a big fan of yours during the speech because you were the most active listener in like the entire room. So I, I appreciated that. I kept kind of going back to you. I was like, it's like, is everybody asleep? Yes, over here. And then no, he's still nodding. Um, so I, pre I appreciate that. Um, just kidding. Um, it's a great, not enough. I mean, the, the short answer is not enough, right? I mean, I got a fairly diverse board, but it doesn't translate far enough into the staff. I got some junior folks, but not enough senior staff. Um, my affiliates tend to be overwhelmingly white because they tend to be more hunter angler types. Um, I, got a, I got a really cool operation in New Mexico right now. It's got a whole bunch of Latinos that are doing like outdoor stuff that are helping with state level advocacy. It's completely the kind of like a random acts of conservation diversity. It's not strategic nearly enough. And so, I mean, if you, that's something you're interested in, like let's talk. Because I got folks that, like, 
one of the things we do a ton in, 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 in education. So we're in like 7,000 schools right now. We're reaching you know, a couple million kids. Of those, like, it's like 56 or 58% are like reduced or free school lunch kids. So like we're reaching like a fairly low income population. How we stay with them and how they participate and how we engage them. The problem with all these organizations is that they're so dependent on money, right? They're so trying to fundraise all the time. Where it's like if you can't give your 15 bucks for your magazine, all of a sudden like you don't count. Where I'll take a young person that's interested in these issues that's willing to you know maybe get involved in the community. I don't need the money, right? And frankly, the, the activism is worth more because I'll, I'll go raise money some, somewhere else on that project. So I mean, to be very candid with you, we, we just, it hasn't been seen as enough of a priority. Um, a lot of folks are talking about it, and I think there's a lot of like LCV and the League of Conservation Voters done some good things with like trying to identify like Latino conservation voters. Um, there's been some good inner city work. Like, we do a lot with like Army Corps reform, which seems like esoteric, but um, a lot of the projects do have some often have Im adverse impacts, and so low income communities for some of the dredging projects. So there's things like that that are kind of opportunistic, but it's not sustained, it's not strategic, and it's not dealing with folks at like a leadership and a community level. So I mean, it's something that I'm struggling with a lot. That I you know I've only been in the job for seven months now, but I mean, we need to look like the country, and that's not just a city, right? That's not just a city. We need to look more rural, too. I mean, like, if the environmental community in this country is, I mean, I'll end, I'll end with this, I guess. If the environmental community in this country is coastal, elite, white, and upper income, like, we don't get things done long term, right? We need to look like the entire country, and that means rich and poor, black and white, north and south, you know, Latino. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Right now, a lot of the groups in this space are fairly toxic, particularly to Republicans. Right? We allowed it to become a one-party issue. It wasn't like this always. You know, 40 years ago, when these things were passing, when the Clean Water Act passed in 1972, Nixon vetoed it the first time. And you know, overwhelming majorities on both sides rose up to overturn his veto. And his veto actually wasn't over the substance. It was over the grant program. He didn't like, he didn't like the Clean Water State Revolving Fund for water infrastructure because he thought it was too big of a budget item. And so to go from there to now, right, where you can't even have these conversations, and I would argue that there was a, there was a nationwide Part of it's media, part of it was the Time Magazine cover, the, the Cuyahoga River, all this kind of stuff, which actually was actually, the photo was actually from 10 years earlier, it actually wasn't from that time, which is kind of funny. Um, but it's because there was, a, there was a national relevance and a national um, identification of this problem, this issue was important and that it was nonpartisan. If there's any chance to depoliticize these issues, I believe it's around wildlife and the outdoors and kids. Because I think the carbon stuff is so polarized right now that it's going to be hard to get back to that point. The, the, the general kind of oil and gas issues are so polarized right now. But if we can work our way back to this lens of wildlife, um, and the Department of Interior, maybe taking the lead a little bit more. I mean, there's a, there's a way to kind of do this um, and bring people with us and actually, uh, and actually recruit and be attractive and enticing to folks of all colors, of all races, of all incomes. Um, we can overcome these challenges because at the end of the day, there's 300 million people. I mean, I don't care how much money like a couple industry guys throw at this thing. There's power in that. And it may sound naive to some folks that have heard this kind of story before, but we don't have any alternative because the consequences of failure are unacceptable. So. Colin, thank you so much.